Hey 
of the Lord and to be reminded of so many great things as while we sing. There really is no other name under heaven and earth that we should worship this morning. We give him honor, we give him praise because he is worthy of that. And so this morning as we uh, take just a moment, I love it, as uh, Corey plays here, if you just bow your heads for a moment, maybe you will be filled with awestruck wonder of the glory of who he is. He is worthy of that this morning put our hearts and our minds on the Lord and allow him to begin to minister to us. just to settle our hearts and our minds for just a moment as we look to you for our strength and our hope. Thank you for your son and all that he has done for us, that we have uh, uh, the ability to have a relationship with you because of what he did on the cross. No longer there, but uh, no longer in the tomb, but alive. What an amazing story that is. And I'm thankful for that. Thank you for your plan. You redeemed us and we appreciate that so very much. God, I ask that you would just guide and direct us this morning. Thank you once again for all the workers who do so many things here on Sunday. Thank you for all their effort. Thank you for their service. Help us to continue to worship you and all that we do. Lord, with the things that we do, let it be honoring to you. Thank you, Lord, so much. And God, we just ask that you be with Justin this morning as he uh, brings the word of God. Thank you for his class, the wonderful things that we are hearing uh, about this Sunday morning class, Lord. But as we open up your word here at 1030 in this uh, corporate worship time, Lord, I just pray that you would continue to mold and shape us. Make us more like you. Thank you for these compelling questions that we're looking at. We love you, Lord. And, and understand fully that you're not afraid of our questions. Thank you for who you are and all that you are going to do in the lives of the people who are here, people who will hear this on, the, on the, the, the broadcast later. Thank you for what you are going to do in their hearts and in their lives. We need you. We need your strength and your mercies. Thank you for those who have given and continue to give. Lord, this amazing group of people and the Lord, and in all of our activity and all the things that we do, once again, may we honor you in, uh, in those things. We continue to trust you. Help us to be a great witness of who you are and what you have done. Your grace is amazing, full of love, full of hope, 
And we continue to draw on that and lean into your everlasting arms. Thank you for your faithfulness. We need you. Help us to have strength for this coming week and the things that we need to do. Will you join me in a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, Providence. Well, good morning, everyone. It is great and wonderful and amazing to see you all on this beautiful Florida spring morning. Isn't it great? John chapter 18 is where we're going to be this morning. If you want to flip over in your scriptures, John chapter 18. I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. If I don't know you, my name is Justin Crosby. I serve over at Hernando Christian Academy as the secondary Bible teacher. I get to teach 10th, 11th, and 12th grade Bible, which is apologetics, theology, and philosophy and ethics. And I also get to serve as the school's chaplain, so I get to arrange all of our chapel services that we have, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. I love it over there and the ministry that God has allowed me to do. And I also love being a part of this church, uh, this church that loves each other, that loves people, that loves Jesus. And it's a real privilege to be able to come and share with you God's word this morning. And so John chapter 18 is where we're going to begin. I'm going to read our text. Uh, we'll say a word of prayer, and then we'll hop right into it. Uh, John 18, this is God's word. It is inspired. It is infallible. When we hear the word of God read, we are hearing the very heart of our maker. We're going to start in verse 33 and read down to verse 40. Hear God's word. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man to you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. And Barabbas was a robber. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for my beloved brothers and sisters. Thank you for this chance that we get now to open your word, to hear your heart, to consider this compelling question from Pontius Pilate, and to ask ourselves honestly and fairly with full transparency before you how we might answer this question. I pray that anything that comes out of my mouth today would only be what you would have, that it would be edifying to my beloved brothers and sisters. Thank you for your word, which teaches us all truth. And we give this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, when I did youth ministry, and I did youth ministry for quite a long time, uh, one of the things that we would often do is we would do these little icebreaker get to know yous. And one of the more popular ones that we would do over the years is a game called Two Truths and a Lie. Has anyone ever played Two Truths and a Lie before? Okay, a lot of you. So you know the rules, right? I'm going to share with you, I've got three things here that I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to share with you two of them that are true, and one that is a lie, and your goal is to figure out which one is the lie, okay? So I'm going to tell you three things about myself so you can know me a little better, and you've got to figure out which one is the lie. And the only one who's not really allowed to play is my beautiful wife back there because she knows me pretty well, okay? So don't look at what she says. Uh, Kristen, please don't, don't uh, raise your hand for one of these. All right, so here we go. Two truths and a lie. I, Justin Crosby, have owned a pet, A, scorpion, B, tarantula, or C, salamander. Two of those are animals that I have actually owned. One is not, all right? Scorpion, tarantula, salamander. How many of you think I have never owned a scorpion? That's ludicrous. Scorpion, seriously? Okay. How many of you would say tarantula? No way, no hairy tarantula. How about slimy salamander? 
All right, looks like the majority gets salamander. If you said B, tarantula, you are correct. I have never owned a tarantula. I hate spiders, and I would never, ever own one. Uh, I did own a salamander for about eight years. They live a long time. Uh, he was very slimy. And uh, I also did own, briefly, a pet scorpion and an emperor scorpion. My dad had one, and they were actually pretty friendly. You might be surprised. So tarantula is the correct answer, OK? Here we go. Um, next one, and this might give some clarity on the last one. We'll see here. Number A, or letter A, I was bitten in the face by a banana spider. B, I cut my leg with a chainsaw. Or C, I got stabbed in the leg with a pencil and the lead is still there. Bit in the face by a banana spider, cut my leg with a chainsaw, stabbed in the leg with a pencil and the lead is still there. How many would say, you never were bitten in the face by a banana spider? That's the lie. Okay, okay. How about, you've never cut your leg with a chainsaw. How about, you've never been stabbed in the leg with lead still in you? If you said, A, bit in the face, you're correct. I never was bit in the face by a banana. I got one on me once. Maybe that's why I don't like spiders very much. I was running through the woods and ran right through one of their webs, you know, the, the big orange and, or the big yellow and white ones. Maybe that's why I don't like them. But I did cut my leg with a chainsaw when I was getting ready for a youth event. I had to go to the hospital and get stitches. That was fun. And uh, yes, I also, in fact, um, got stabbed in the leg with a pencil and the lead is still there. Uh, fun, fun fact, it happened when I was in first grade because first grade, I tried to kiss a girl. And I learned very early on to respect women and to not, uh, not, to not try to press my luck there, okay? So yes, and the lead, the lead is still there, fun fact. All right, last one. Um, we're doing okay here, but let's, this, this last one might be maybe the most challenging at all, okay? Two truths and a lie. Number one, or A, I've run away from a bear. Letter B, I chased a bear. Or C, I pet a bear. Run away from a bear, chased a bear, pet a bear. How many of you would say, you've never run away from a bear, Justin? That's nonsense. No, okay. How many of you would say, you've never chased a bear? Who would do such a ridiculous thing? How about, you've never pet a bear? You've never pet a bear. I think I got you on this one. The answer is C, I've never pet a bear. It's a true story, yes. I did run away from a bear once, briefly, because we were on the Appalachian Trail and a bear came running through there and my group, like we took off a little bit. It wasn't chasing us, thankfully, but we didn't know what that bear was up to. And uh, one time I did chase a bear that was in a tree outside of my house and foolishly chased a juvenile bear into the darkness trying to scare it away, which don't do that. Uh, Mama Bear, I'm so blessed that Mama Bear wasn't around the corner. Uh, it could have ended very poorly. My wife will tell you that story. It was a very foolish thing I did. You know, sometimes truth can be a difficult thing to figure out, can't it? There are some things that are pretty easy to figure out, like true or false, it's raining outside, true or false. True, very good, at least I think it is. If it's not, it probably will be in the next couple minutes, right? It is absolutely true, and we can know that it's true. Two plus two equals? Five. Five? Oh, a lot of homeschool kids here. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Two plus two equals four, right? We can know that. You take two items, you take two other items, you got four. That's pretty easy to figure out. Some truth is pretty easy to know. Oftentimes, truth is a little bit more complicated. Sometimes truth is a little bit more nebulous, especially when it comes to the issue of moral truth. Absolute truth that is unchanging, that doesn't come and go, that isn't fluctuating with opinions. Sometimes truth like that can be a little complicated because for a lot of folks, that kind of truth really isn't even actually real at all. That kind of truth doesn't really exist. The question that we're going to analyze this morning is asked by Pontius Pilate to Jesus Christ in John chapter 18. And it's three simple words, three words that have perplexed philosophers for thousands of years. And I'm going to propose to you, these three words are still being asked and the answers are still being debated here thousands of years later. And that question is, what is truth? What is truth? Can we know truth? Does truth exist? What is truth? And questioning this idea of truth when it comes to this issue of what is right and wrong and good and evil is best encapsulated in a philosophy called moral relativism. Now, I'm sure you've heard of that term before. How many of y'all have ever heard of the term moral relativism? Moral relativism, okay, quite a few of you. Moral relativism 
is the view that moral judgments, rights and wrongs, good and evils, do's and don'ts, moral judgments are relative to or determined by the context of the evaluator or the situation. It is relative to the context of the evaluator or the situation. What is moral relativism then mean? It means when it comes to this issue of what is true regarding right and wrong, good and evil, there are no definitive answers. There can't be any definitive answers because every situation is going to be different and every person's perspective is going to be different. So under moral relativism, there is no such thing as absolute right and wrong, good and evil, true and false. If we were to ask the question to a moral relativist, is it wrong to steal? The answer must be, well, maybe. Maybe it's wrong to steal if you have plenty of things and you're stealing because you're bored or you're greedy. But maybe it's not wrong to steal if you have good reasons, if you have good motivations, if you're stealing for a noble cause, like Robin Hood or something like that. So when you ask a moral relativist a question of right and wrong, there can never be any sort of definitive answer that is unchanging because there's always going to be a different situation and there will always be specific individuals making those choices. And because that's true, there really can't be any actual truth. And moral relativism for y'all probably picked up. This is kind of the motto of our culture today. It asserts that no one can really know moral truth because ultimately there is no real moral truth. And this is perhaps no better encapsulated with this expression. And I bet you've all heard it and I bet you can finish it with me. Well, what's right for you might be right for you, but what's right for me is right for me. You're free to make your choices and do your thing if you want to follow your religion or, or follow your, uh, your ethics that you were brought up with, you can do that, but I'm free to follow what I believe to be true, to follow what I think is right and wrong, to follow where my heart leads. And at the end of the day, neither one of us are actually right and wrong because there is no actual real truth. So here's the question for you, beloved. Is there real truth? Does truth exist? Is there really truly such thing as moral rights and wrongs that are unchanging, that do not fluctuate with the winds of culture and personal opinion? Now, I think if I were to ask you that question, in fact, let me go and ask you, do you think there is actual real moral truth? Yes, of course you would say yes, right? We're in church, we believe in the Bible. Of course we would say, yes, we believe in moral truth. I know, and I feel that too. My knee-jerk reaction is gonna be, absolutely there is truth. Of course there must be truth. There needs to be truth. But I believe an honest evaluation, an honest evaluation with ourselves might reveal that we're actually led and governed by our feelings a lot more than we might realize. We might say and proclaim and legitimately mean that we believe that there are moral truths and rights and wrongs, but a lot of the times, what actually guides our thinking, what actually determines our steps is not this real truth, but real feelings and how those feelings impact how we think and evaluate, especially other people. We justify and rationalize our choices through lenses, lenses of opinions, desires, culture, a lot more than we might think. And this is especially true when we consider the actions of other people. We, we don't want to judge the actions of other people. We don't want to assert our view on other people. It's uncomfortable to do so. It's difficult. And so, so we'll often walk away with phrases like, well, you know, I wouldn't do that, but you know, you know ultimately that's, that's your choice and, and, and ultimately you, you, you've got to decide for yourself. And I wouldn't do it, but, but you know, who am I to judge what you would or you wouldn't do? So is this an option for Christians, this moral relativism? Is this compatible with biblical Christianity? Is this something that we can walk away with and, and take the easy route today as we leave church and just walk away and, and answer Pilate's question by throwing up our hands and shrugging our shoulders and saying, well, well, I don't know. Maybe there's truth. Maybe there's not. Maybe there's your truth and my truth. And, and, and maybe, maybe I'll just do my thing and, and you do your thing. I'm going to present to you this morning that I don't believe that is an option for Christians. And I think the scriptures teach it. 
I think the scriptures go out of its way, God goes out of the way in his word to communicate that truth matters very much to him. And if truth matters to God, then truth better matter to us. If there is truth, then that means that there is the opposite of truth, which is false or lies. And guess what? We live in God's moral universe and there are consequences to believing and acting with that which is false. Regardless of what we feel, regardless of what we want, and you and I need to go to truth to learn truth and be firmly established in what we believe and why. So I wanna show you four things this morning from our text that I believe God's word shows and communicates that would help us if we're, if we're honest and if we do the hard work to evaluate our own truth views. And maybe, hopefully, Lord willing, to be able to engage other people with these truth issues a little more effectively, okay? So here's the first thing I want us to see this morning. Look down in your scriptures. Point number one, Jesus bears witness to or testifies to the truth. Therefore, truth must exist. Let me repeat that. Jesus bears witness to the truth. Therefore, truth must exist. Look at John 18, 37. Pilate said to him, you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say I'm a king. For this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world. To bear witness to the truth. Why did Jesus come into the world? To love people, right? Yes. To die on the cross for our sins, of course. To model and show the perfect life. Yes. Why else did he come to this earth? According to his own words. Why, brothers? Why, sisters? Why? To bear witness to the truth. To testify to it. Now, if Christ came to bear witness to and testify to the truth, then that means something. It means that there must be truth with which he is bearing witness to and testifying to. There has to be objective truth. Otherwise, what is Jesus bearing witness to? You can't bear witness to something that doesn't exist. You can't testify to something that isn't real. You only can bear witness to and testify to that which is something you're claiming is real and true. And so when Jesus says that he bears witness to the truth, it means that there has to be objective truth. And what does that mean for us? It means that we as Christians cannot, we cannot embrace or condone moral relativism. It's incompatible with Christ because Christ came to bear witness to and testify to that which is true, which means that which is true has to exist regardless of what I think, regardless of what you think, regardless of what your neighbors think or your coworkers. Regardless of what any of us think and want and desire, truth must exist because Christ is bearing witness to it. Now, I'm going to tell you something you already know. This reality is going to put us at odds with our culture. You know this, right? You and I have to come to grips with the reality that we live in a culture that is quickly, in America, shifting from a Christian culture to a post-Christian culture. And the idea that there is truth that is true regardless of feelings or culture or desires is going to put us at odds with a culture that does not like or want to hear such things. Moral relativism is the motto of the day for a reason. Because it allows people to basically just, you know, I'm going to do my life, you do yours, and that way there's no conflict. That way we can all just get along until those truths contradict each other. And, and then we've got some serious problems. This is going to put us at odds with our culture. And we need to ask the honest question, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for our beliefs and our convictions? What does it mean for our testimony? What does it mean for our willingness to stand and make claims that might make people very upset, that might put people off, that might, people, make, might make people say some very unkind things about you, like, like, like terms like hateful and judgmental, and, and perhaps the, the biggest one of our culture today, bigot. We have to embrace the reality that as Christ's followers, we must also, brothers and sisters, bear witness to the truth, which means there are going to be times when the truth is proclaimed and people are not going to want to receive it or hear it, and that's going to create conflict. But if we just throw up our hands like Pontius Pilate and go, what is truth? Then we are not being followers of Christ. He bore witness to the truth. 
And truth ultimately is defined by God. Why is truth defined by God? Because God is true. And because God is true, when he declares what is right and true, it can't be anything but true. I'm gonna share with you two passages of scripture. You've probably heard these before. John 3, Jesus says, whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. That God is true. Romans chapter three, verse four, Paul says, by no means let God be true, though every one of us were liars. God is true. And so truth exists because God exists. And when we look at moral truth, we are looking at the character of God. I ask my students in ethics class sometimes, you know, we talk about objective rights and wrongs and good and evils and truth and our worldview of truth. And I ask them the question, how did God determine what is ethically true? How did God figure out that lying was bad and honesty was good and that faithfulness was good and infidelity was bad? Where did God come up with all of these things? Did God bust out his ethics textbook and look up the answer and be like, oh, okay, cool. Let me communicate that to these mortals, that this is what, they, this is, what is right and wrong. Well, if, if that's the case, then that means that truth is above God. That, that'd be a problem. Was God like arbitrary? Did he flip a coin? Hmm, lying or honesty, good or evil? Ding, ding. Lying is bad. Declare it, let it be said, thus saith the Lord. Is that how God determined moral truth? And the answer is no. God determined and declared moral truth by his own character. God is good. He is honest. He can't lie. So when we lie, we are acting opposite the character of God. God is compassionate. He is merciful. So when we are compassionate and merciful, as opposed to bitter and resentful, we are acting in line with the character of God. God is true, and Jesus bears witness to that truth, so truth must exist. We cannot allow moral relativism to ever take root in our hearts and lives. We can't, because the scriptures don't allow for it. It's incompatible with our faith. The second thing I want you to, oh, by the way, uh, this is a little fun fact for you. The term true or truth is used 43 times in the Gospel of John alone. It's only 21 chapters in the whole book. And that term is used 43 times. You think John was trying to communicate something? You think John wanted to get a message across? Yeah, I think he did. I think he absolutely did. The second thing I want us to see this morning, there is truth. Number two, there is no truth apart from Christ. There is no truth apart from Christ. Look at the last part of verse 37. Again, look what he says in verse 37. He says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What does that mean for us? It means that we cannot go to any other source to determine truth. We can't go outside of Christ to find out what is true, to find out what is right. We can't go to our friends. We can't go to our family. We can't go to prophets and to religions and to establishments and to governments that constantly fluctuate and contradict. There is only one place we can go, and that place is Christ. He is the source of truth. We cannot go to our culture. We can't go to our past. We can't go to our feelings to try to figure out what our heart says because Jesus says, Everyone who is of the truth listens to his voice. So we only can go to him and hear his voice to find truth. And here's perhaps the more daunting aspect of this fact. If that is true, right? There, everyone who is of the truth hears his voice. Then the opposite must also be true. To reject the voice of Christ is to reject truth. To reject the voice of Christ is to reject truth truth. There cannot and will not be any truth found outside of what God has revealed. And when other religions and philosophies and worldviews testify and agree with what the scripture says, and many do, they're simply affirming what is true and declaring it to be so. They're not defining truth. That would be like me telling you it is raining outside, thinking that my proclamation of raining is making the droplets fall. No, I'm simply testifying to what is reality. When another religion, another philosophy agrees with what the scripture says, it is because Romans 2, God has written his law on the hearts of all of the humanity through our conscience, and we bear witness to that when we affirm what God says is right and wrong. It's a way he's revealed himself to all people. 
Not everyone has the scriptures in their hands. We all have creation. We all have a conscience. And these are ways that God has revealed himself and in his goodness has given us things like morality and conscience so we don't all destroy ourselves. And that's exactly what happens when we abandon moral truth. We get nothing but conflict and and destruction. There is no truth apart from Christ and we cannot look to truth apart from Christ. Now, I need to pause here and we're gonna cover this kind of a little bit more at the end. Do you and I actually take some time every now and then to evaluate where we're and how we're being influenced? Not everything that is an attack on truth comes out and says it is. A lot of times the most dangerous attacks on truth are claims that have truth in it, but not full truth, that present one side of the truth, but not all of the truth. And these are the areas perhaps that we need to be most on guard. Charles Spurgeon talked about this discipline. He called it discernment. And Charles Spurgeon said that discernment is the difference between knowing right and almost right. Because sometimes that which is almost right can even be more destructive than that which is blatantly wrong. Because it's so much more deceptive and easy to buy into. So question for you, brothers and sisters. Think about the major issues of our culture today. Think about the battlegrounds where there are fights and debates and arguments over what is moral, what is right and what is wrong. Who's defining what you think right now? Can you confidently say and answer that question that Pilate asked with that which is based in scripture? Or perhaps has some of our thinking and influence and truth claims of our own been perhaps influenced by other things, our culture, what we want, our feelings. I think we need, it would be wise to consider that. Number three, I want us to see this morning, moral relativism evades responsibility. Why is moral relativism such a problem? It evades responsibility. What is truth? That question ultimately means what? I will do what I want. I will do what I want. John 18, 38, Pilate said to him, What is truth? And you'll notice he doesn't say, what is truth? Please tell me, Jesus. Let's dialogue. Let's debate. Let's discuss. What does Pilate do? After he hears truth claims, he walks away from the situation. He goes back outside to the Jews and says, I find no guilt in him. You know what the saddest part of this is? What was Pilate's job as governor in this situation? What was his job? Why were the Jews bringing him before Pilate? What was Pilate supposed to do? Make a decision. Find out what's true. Find out what's right and what's actually reality. That was his job as the governor. And guys, the Romans loved their laws. They were a land of law and order, which is why the Jews actually had to bring Jesus to Pilate and they couldn't just kill them themselves. The Romans loved their law and order, but now we have the governor of this Roman province and he gets this truth claim. And instead of actually dealing with it, what does he do? What is truth? And he walks away from it. He walks away. Moral relativism is an evasion of intellectual responsibility. Confronting the truthfulness of our thinking and our actions is very challenging, isn't it? Confronting and digging and trying to discover what is right and wrong, what is true and false, that might demand things from us. It might demand that we change our our position. It might challenge our comforts. It might challenge our desires. Or perhaps, worst of all, Confronting moral truth might put us at odds with other people who disagree. It might sever our relationships. It might make people very unhappy. It will. (laughs) It will. And so it is far more tempting to evade this by simply throwing up our hands like Pontius Pilate, walk away, not do the hard work of working through the issues, Say, there's nothing really we can do. Who knows? You know, okay, you know, you do you, I do me. Who really knows? What is truth? Moral relativism ultimately doesn't actually seek answers. It actively avoids them by pretending they don't exist. It's an evasion of responsibility. And this is the last thing I want you to see this morning. Okay? We know that there is truth. We know there is no truth apart from God. We know that moral relativism evades responsibility. Here's the last thing I want you to see. There are consequences to ignoring the truth. There are consequences to ignoring the truth. 
in this particular text, what do we see? An innocent man dies for moral relativism. The answer Pontius Pilate walks away with, which is no answer, ends up leading to the death of an innocent man, which was a broken justice system and a government that loved its laws and justice. There is consequence to evading moral truth. And there always will be because we live in God's world and his design and he has designed it to work a certain way. We can evade the question all day long. It will not make the consequences of those issues go away. It doesn't change the fact that, Galatians 6, we reap what we sow, regardless of our opinion, regardless of our culture, regardless of anything we want or think. There are consequences. Ignoring reality is not going to stop those consequences, and we will reap what we sow. So what is it that defines your moral truth this morning? Have you thought about it? I know, like I said in the beginning of this message, that if I were to ask, I believe that all of us with total, total, total confidence raise our hands and say, yes, there is truth. But the question really needs to be boiled down to what is actually impacting our lives. And that's not what we say with our lips on a Sunday morning on principle, but how we're actually thinking and how we're actually looking at the situations in our lives. I know that you all have people in your lives who you love dearly. And these people that you love dearly have different views on things like what is moral and what is right and what is wrong. And I know it is terrifying to think about the conflict that might come by absolutely refusing to capitulate to a lie. But capitulating to a lie isn't gonna make the consequence of the lie go away. And I know it is easy because I have fallen victim to this myself. I have absolutely perpetuated this to evade it and simply ignore it than to actually work through it, to search the scriptures, to think through the implications of my beliefs and maybe change my own actions. It's so much easier to evade it and ignore it. Despite what we say, that's the reality, unfortunately, of a lot of the way our lives end up living. So two questions for you, or one question, and then one encouragement if I can. The first one is what I just said. Are we evading the truth? Are we conveniently ignoring the possible implications of our beliefs? I would challenge you, brothers and sisters, to think of that carefully. As you walk away with this compelling question, what is truth? How would you answer it this morning? And then perhaps maybe a next step, a next level, how does your life show you answer the question? How does my choices and my thinking show I actually answer that question? There are consequences, and we need to think of it carefully. And if I can encourage you, brothers and sisters, this is so great. I love this. If you hear nothing else from me this morning, hear this. This is great. Look at this. We know the truth. The truth that we know frees us, and God has given us the truth. God has given us the truth. Listen, God has not left us to blindly wander around in the darkness of philosophy and and, 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 and logic to try to grasp at what is true. God has given us the truth. God in his love and his compassion has spoken into history, has revealed himself, and he has declared to you and I the truth. And we have two pieces of the truth available to us anytime, anywhere, to guard our hearts and minds. We have the truth incarnate, Jesus Christ, amen? We have Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. That is both a bold moral claim, no other way to the Father, but what a blessed reality it is. We have the truth of Jesus Christ and we have a relationship with him. We can build our lives on what he says. We can trust and believe that he is with us and he'll never leave us or forsake us. We can look to his resurrection for our own hope. We can trust his promises because he's always faithful. We have the truth because the truth became a person and lived and loved and sacrificed and died. We have the truth of Jesus Christ. And where do we hear it all? Where do we see it? We have the truth preserved in the word of God. God has not left us to figure it out on our own. We can't. Look at the culture, brothers and sisters. Look at the confusion. Look at the chaos. 
Look at the discontentment and the, the uncertainty. That's what you get when you build your life apart from the truth preserved in the word of God. And we don't have to have that happen in our own lives. We can go to the scriptures and we can see with our own eyes truth preserved. John uh, says in John 8, 31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Every day we get to pick up the preserved truth, the preserved word, and we get to hear the heart of God and we can look to and know and do the hard work of digging in and determining and figuring out not what we think and feel, but what God's word declares. And then we get to move forward in a culture that's constantly shifting, unafraid and uncertain of what comes because we have built our lives on the rock, the foundation of truth of the word of God that will never change, never fluctuate, never go to what things are feeling or wanting or desiring that always, always, and this is the craziest part, y'all. This is so great. Every time we do what it says, it works. That's not a coincidence. It's because it is truth and it is from God and it works. And every time it works, it testifies to the truthfulness of the author who inspired it. Aren't you thankful for that, brothers and sisters? Aren't you thankful that we have the word of God this morning with which we can build our lives on and we can know for certainty the truth? I'm so thankful for it. I hope you are too. So here's my last challenge for us. James chapter one. Let's be doers of the word, the truth, not hearers only deceiving ourselves. God forbid that I or you walk away from here going, yeah, truth, woohoo, yeah, Justin, woo and then not actually digging in and rooting our lives on what it says. So let's get in and share it with others, know it for ourselves, and stand firm on it, okay? Let's pray together. God, thank you so much that you've given us your amazing truth. What a privilege it is. What an amazing joy it is to be able to come to it and to find that which never changes because you never change and you've designed everything to work perfectly. God, I thank you that you've communicated that to us. And I thank you so much for Christ. God, you know how often I believe these things with my mind, but God, how often I fail to follow them with my life and my choices. But I have Christ who I can root my life on, who can take all of my lies and failures and rejections of truth and took them all to the Christ, to the cross and had your wrath poured out on him for my failures. I have that. I know my brothers and sisters know that truth. And if any do not, Lord, I pray you would not let them leave this place this morning before they can know for certain the truth of Christ that will set them free. We just thank you and love you for all that you're doing and all that you've given us. You're such a good, amazing God. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. In Christ alone is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone is solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving seems. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love. And righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I There in the ground his body lay, 
light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand Till He returns Or He calls me home Here in the power of Christ I stand Amen. Hear now the benediction. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. See you guys next week.